The 29-year-old Wordsworth seemed destined for greatness, even at this young age. Catherine Clarkson, who was the wife of Thomas Clarkson, who had worked so ardently against the slave trade, when she met Wordsworth with Coleridge on the banks of Usemere in their new-built house where they were resting after all their endeavours against the slave trade, could see in him qualities that were like a general. And she sees him also delightfully uh, in relation to his friend Coleridge, who is showing off. Coleridge was in high spirits and talked a great deal. Wordsworth was more reserved, but there was neither hauteur nor moroseness in his reserve. He has a fine, commanding figure. He's rather handsome and looks as if he was born to be a great prince or a great general. He seems very fond of Coleridge, laughing at all his jokes and taking all opportunities of showing him off. To crown all, he has the manners of a gentleman. Dorothy is 28. Christmas Day is her birthday. She is described by Coleridge as guilt was a thing impossible in her. But for Wordsworth, she was particularly his eyes and ears. She gave me eyes, she gave me ears. And that detailed account of the universe we have memorably recorded in her great Grasmere journals. She wrote it, of course, so that she could give pleasure to William when he returned from a visit he had taken to Yorkshire with their brother John. I resolved to write a journal of the time till William and John return, and I set about keeping my resolve, because I will not quarrel with myself, and because I shall give William pleasure by it when he comes home again. In the journal, you find all the accounts of their domestic life, what they read, what they wrote, what the illnesses were, what the neighbours said, what vagrants they met as they walked around the countryside, what the trees looked like, what the weather was like, and altogether you have the detailed information which makes her a great researcher for Wordsworth. She herself is described memorably by De Quincey. Her face was of Egyptian brown. Rarely in a woman of English birth had I seen a more determinate gypsy tan. Her eyes were not soft, but they were wild and startling and hurried in their motion. Her manner was warm and even ardent. Her sensibility seemed constitutionally deep and some subtle fire of impassioned intellect apparently burned within her. Saturday, 17th of May, 1800. Incessant rain from morning till night. Thomas Ashburner brought us coals, worked hard, and read Midsummer Night's Dream, ballads. Sauntered a little in the garden. The scobby sate quietly in its nest, rocked by the winds and beaten by the rain. The story of Thomas Ashburner would be the kind of story that would be behind the greatest poem that Wordsworth was to write in his first year at Town End. The story of Michael, which is a story of a man who loses his land and therefore also loses his son. Remember that Wordsworth has never lived in Grasmere, and so when he comes here, he has, as it were, to make his own map. He doesn't even know the names of places so he gives it names of the, that he invents. And he wants to attach the sheepfold, which he and Dorothy found up this valley, attach it to a human story. And he marvelously had Dorothy's description, which was that the sheepfold was like a heart of unequal halves. And it is a story of two people, unequal halves, the father who suffers and the son who leaves him. Michael is an old Grasmere shepherd who has guaranteed a loan for his nephew. The debt is called in and he is faced with the terrible choice of selling off his land or sending his son Luke to London to see if he can raise the money. On Luke's departure, he strikes a bargain with him. Luke will work to redeem the debt and he, Michael, will work to build a sheepfold which the flock has needed. Luke is seduced by city life and has eventually to leave the country. 
Michael is left at the age of 80, solemnly building his sheepfold, determined that he at least shall keep his side of the bargain.